Today, we're going to take a look at the subject of faith and love. Love is a quality of life that makes living worthwhile. It's the sum total of the duty of man, loving God and loving others. It's the main quality of God himself. Now, it's defined in the dictionary as a deep devotion or affection for another person or persons, a strong sexual passion for another person, a very great interest or enjoyment of something, the kindness and the charitableness man should show toward one another. Now, the opposite of love can be hate or it can be just disregard for that person. Now, one of the things we're going to have to get a hold of here to put this whole thing that we call love together and later we're going to call intimacy is what we call attachment. Because, do you see, every kid desperately needs love. And kids that don't attach to their parents end up with something we call the reaction attachment disorder and it totally will destroy their life. They'll end up being totally selfish. They'll end up being totally unable to relate and to deal with other people. And this many times relates to oppositional defiant disorder or antisocial personality disorder. Now this whole subject of attachment wasn't really understood till back in about the 1950s. And there was a doctor there and this particular doctor had a sanatorium where they would bring kids that had tuberculosis to isolate them from society so tuberculosis would not spread. And he noticed something about the kids that were brought to his sanatorium. He noticed that the first thing that happened when the kid arrived is that they would protest when their parents tried to leave. Then after their parents left for a while, the child would go into what he called despair. That means that the child would be just laying in bed, would have nothing to do with the doctors, wouldn't play the games, wouldn't do anything. But after a while, they would seem to adapt. But what really told the story was when the parents came back and they would hide their colored pictures from their parents. They really wanted nothing to do with their parents. What had happened? They'd found that their parents were not safe attachment figures, and so they had detached. Then they continued this research, and in a particular study, they had an office like that of a doctor. And they would bring a little kid with his mom there, and there'd be a stranger sitting in the doctor's office, and then the doctor or the nurse would come and get mom. And they would notice how the kid would respond. Well, most of the kids would protest again. They would throw a tantrum, tantrum, cry, try to follow mom. But they noticed there were some other kids that didn't seem to care or didn't seem to make any difference. But when they put a monitor on those kids, they found out that those kids were just as distraught as the other kids. What really showed the difference then was when the mother came back. And from this they came up with what we call four different attachment styles. And these attachment styles are part of this entire picture that we're going to call intimacy in this class. The first kid, and we're going to call this kid the secure attacher. And the secure attacher believes that they are secure in life to such a degree that they're lovable, they can accept themselves, other people accept them and will give them love and they're capable of receiving love. And they believe other people are also safe and they can trust other people. And when mom comes back, this kid just runs up to mom, mom picks them up, gives them a big hug and they're just fine. Then we have the second type of attachment, and we're going to call that the ambivalent attachment style or the cautious attachment style. And this kid believes that other people are safe and okay, but they don't believe that they're safe and okay. 
unless they perform. So when mom comes back, this kid runs to mom, mom picks them up, but they squirm, they can never settle down because unless they think they're performing well enough, mom's really not going to accept them and they're really not going to be loved. Then we had the next one. This is the one that showed no response at all when mom left. And this kid doesn't show any response when mom comes back. And the reason is this kid doesn't feel they can trust anyone else and therefore they say to themselves, I've got to take care of myself. And so they attach very lightly and they protect themselves and they tend to perform. Where the other one was really more of a people pleaser, they're more of a performance type of a person because they've got to take care of themselves and they really don't care that much what other people really think about them because they don't feel they can really trust them. And the final kid, we call this the disorganized or the fearful attacher. Many times these kids were abused. Many times they really don't know what to expect from their mom. And that's why they call him the disorganized attacher. Because when mom comes back, they don't know what they're going to do. They may run to the stranger. They may run out the door. They may hit mom. They may grab onto mom. Because, see, they're not sure. They're trying to read mom. If mom seems to be safe, then they're going to try to attach to mom. If mom doesn't look safe, they're going to act like that avoidant attacher and stay away from mom. Because, see, they don't believe that other people are safe, but they also can't trust themselves. So who are they going to trust? When we're talking about attachment, attachment is very much like a thermostat. It has a high range. It has a low range. Everyone wants to have a certain amount of relationship with people up here but they don't want to be smothered by people. And that's sort of the range. And the way we look at it is if people get too far away, someone that's important to you, your attachment alarm goes off and you turn on the heater. But if they get too close, another attachment alarm goes off and you turn on the air conditioner. And of course, the problem is when we're relating to other people, their attachment thermostat might be very different. Now, what do we all really want? We really want deep inside of us, the scared little boy or the scared little girl just wants to be loved. And what does love look like? Well, we're going to suggest it is a safe place. It's where you can be yourself, where other people can be themselves, and you feel safe. How do we define safe when we're talking about attachment? First, the person has to be trustworthy. If they promise something, they're going to follow through with it. Second, they must be available because even if they're trustworthy, if they're not here, they can't meet my needs. And third, they need to be emotionally sensitive. And I'm going to suggest that based on that criteria, God is the ultimate attachment figure because he's absolutely trustworthy. He's always available. And because of him coming down in the form of Jesus, he's very emotionally sensitive. So then the question is, how do we learn to love? Well, a child, as they grow up, experience different things in their lives. That little child that skins their knee and runs to mommy, well, if mommy picks him up and gives him a big hug, that feels like love. And as they relate to other people, they notice the facial expressions, the touch, all of those kind of things really feels like love. And the child learns from their experiences. Again, whether the world is a dangerous place and they can trust other people, whether they are lovable, the very things that determine those attachment styles that we were talking about. And the child from that learns 
and comes up with an attachment style usually between the ages of one or two and this style might be carried on throughout their entire life of the way we attach. Now attachment is just part of this thing that we're going to call intimacy. It's that deep down need that all of us need inside of ourselves. It's characterized by a pronounced closeness of friendship, relationship, or association. The Bible tells us that it's God's goal for all of us that we have that kind of a super close relationship with God and with other people. John 17, 21 that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory that thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Now it turns out that our description of love in English is fairly confused, as I think you may have noticed in the definition when I read that. It can mean almost anything from sex to loving ice cream to liking some particular thing. And if we go to the Greek words, we can get a lot more understanding of what these look like, but they're only approximations. We can come up with some English words that will approximate the Greek words for love. And we need all five of these together to make up this package that's going to meet our deepest needs that we're going to call intimacy. The first one, the Greek word is agape. It's the kind of love that God has, and this is the unconditional commitment or acceptance that we all so desperately and deeply need. The second is called eros. It's the romantic type of love. It's the type of love that, where people fall in love, get married, that kind of thing. It's the romance. Then we have phileo. This is the friendship type of love. This is companionship. The city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. We have spiritual or intuitive love. The word here is phileo. And it's how much am I on the same wavelength, think the same way, want the same things as somebody else. And finally, we have physical or sexual love. In the Bible, the term is used to know, as Adam knew his wife, and they had children. Now, in the world, what kind of love? Which one of those kind of loves is emphasized the most? And the type of love of the world is best described as selfish love. I love you for what I get back from you. In fact, when many years ago, I was dating. There was a poster that a lot of the girls had in their apartments, and it said this, I love you for what I am when I'm with you. Well, what were they just saying? For what I get out of it. And unfortunately, that's what it's all about, and we shouldn't be surprised, should we? because we said everybody starts out selfish, trying to meet those needs for self-worth, significance, love, and security in a selfish way. And of course, God wants to transform that. Now, how about God's type of love? And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Well, the closest thing we can describe that is motherly love. But even in our world today, Mothers love because they do get something from their children and they have hopes for their children are going to affect their own lives. So it's still a pretty much a mixed bag. Unfortunately, selfish love in our world is the norm. We sort of expect that. Now, how about the feelings of love? Well, Dr. Harley is known for his love bank theory. 
And the love bank theory says this. We love based on what other people do for us or how we perceive what they actually do for us. And he would suggest that when we've just met a person and they're a stranger, their love bank account has zero points. But if they do things for us and we like them and we get along with them and so on, at about 250 points, they become an acquaintance. And about 500 points, they become a friend. About 750 points, they become a best friend. At 1,000 points, we're madly in love. But the opposite is true. If they do things that we perceive as negative, do things that we don't see are in our best interest, we give them negative points. And that bank account can erode. And it can go below zero to the point where at maybe negative 250, somebody we don't like. Negative 500, they're an enemy. Negative 750, they're a worst enemy. Negative 1,000, I had a lady say this, I get physically ill if I even think of my husband. But it's all perception and we have to realize that. I actually had a situation, there's a test that goes along with Harley's theory that I gave to a lady and she marked her husband minus three. It goes from minus three to plus three on every question of the entire test. And so my perception is this guy must not be doing anything for her. He's not making any points at all. But he was doing about three times for this lady what the average husband does. So I asked her, okay, what is it? How do you interpret it if your husband brings you flowers? Oh, that's easy. He's manipulating me to get sex. So do you see all the positive stuff he did, he was getting negative points for, and that's why his bank account was so bankrupt. Let's look now at the world system and what its consequences are. Because selfish love can never provide the level of security required for a secure attachment, it e easily leads to jealousy. If you're supposed to be meeting my needs and you start meeting somebody else's needs or you say something nice to somebody else, I lose. Selfish love looks out for itself first and will refuse to go beyond just being fair. That's one of the problems we have in marriage counseling called marriage deadlock. It means this person is saying, I'll do something for you if you do something for me. And the other one says, no, no, you do it for me first and then I will do it for you. And they get locked in a battle to force the other one to meet their needs. Selfish love can never fully meet a giver's needs because we reap what we sow. If I sow selfish love, what am I going to get back? Selfish love. And that's never going to totally satisfy, satisfy me no matter what. How many of you ever heard of the paradox of love? Well, the paradox of love says this. Those who perceive love in order to get their needs met repel the love of others while those who give love unconditionally receive it back in abundance. So what's happening? They're violating this very paradox. If you grab somebody by the neck and say, love me or I'll punch your lights out, how do they react? Selfish love has difficulty accepting change. All marriages change. They're what are called the passions of marriages, the way we change. First when we get married, then we first have children, then when the children grow up, then as we grow old together, the relationship changes and people change. But if I'm in this relationship for you to meet my needs in a particular way and you change and quit doing that, our marriage is going to be in trouble. Because a person primarily cares about his own feelings, he is easily provoked, blames the other person, strikes back when he feels hurt, and ends up in a deadlock relationship full of deep emotional 
pain. Hurting people hurt people. If my needs don't get met, I'm going to try to manipulate you. I'm going to strike out. I'm going to be mad at you. We have all sorts of drama going on in this relationship. Selfish love and insecure attachment styles lead directly to codependency, addictions, domestic violence, and other types of dysfunction. When I'm insecure, I'm going to do what I need to do to get my needs met. I may kill my emotional pain with drugs and alcohol. I may be codependent, manipulating other people to meet my needs, try to change other people. I may even be domestically violent because I'm so afraid you're going to leave me that I try to turn you into a sniveling idiot to get you to stay with me. Selfish love can motivate a person to protect themselves by avoiding deep attachments. Unfortunately, and especially with the avoidant attachment style, they many times withdraw and they hide and there are many ways of hiding. It can be at bars, it can be drugs, alcohol, even karaoke, bowling, bingo, watching sports, pornography, gentlemen's clubs, sexual promiscuity, and eating addictions, TV, soaps, romance novels, escaping into fantasy, possessing things, maintaining a house, or even vacations. Those are all ways that we don't have to be very close to somebody else. And today, of course, one of the most popular ones is living together with someone without being married because you don't have the commitment. You don't have to worry that much about having that deep, close relationship. But of course, what? Are our needs going to get met? Absolutely not. Selfish love easily fails due to superficial attachment. Because we attach lightly, we really don't get that deep need for acceptance of that scared little boy and that scared little girl deep inside of me met. Selfish love can never meet a person's need for deep, unconditional love. I'm going to suggest the only one that can really meet that need is Jesus himself. But how about God's system? Let's take a look at God's system now. Unconditional love comes only from God and is the primary characteristic of God. And we'll read a lot of Bible verses here to really get a solid foundation for this. 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Jesus demonstrated the love of God to us when he died for us on the cross. 1 John 3:16. This is how we know the love of this is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. God's type of love is unconditional. That means we don't have to do anything for it. That means no matter how we act, no matter what we do, He's going to love us anyway. Romans 5, 8, But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And nothing can separate us from that kind of love that God has for us. Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's type of unconditional love fulfills the law. Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is a fulfilling of the law. God values love above everything. It is through love that God draws people to
to himself. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with love kindness have I drawn thee. Our experience of love begins with our desire to know him. Proverbs 8, 17. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early will find me. That's God talking. Love in each other is crucial to the further development of God's type of love and the basis of authentic spiritual life. As we get more of God's love in us, as we give it more to other people, and we receive it back, it changes us, and it changes our relationship with God. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Love is the most valuable of all emotions and meets our deepest needs. Song of Solomon 8-7 Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. The way the Bible looks at it is that unless it's motivated by love, it's worthless. 1 Corinthians 13-1 if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. And the Bible then gives us a wonderful description of God's type of unconditional love. And the word here is translated as charity in the King James. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaulteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. Now, our human emotions that go along with love are the same emotions that go along with the selfish love. They go along with the agape love. The only difference is the source and where it is coming from. And we tend to love others that tend to love us and have the emotions that go along with it when other people need our needs, as we talked about in the area of selfish love. And this love is contagious. And when our needs are met, then we love others and we want to help others and want to meet their needs and they in turn meet our needs. Love is a sign of true Christianity. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Love is to provide the motivation for our actions and actually the motivation even for us to be willing to obey God. Because see, if I really believe God has my best interest in mind and he's perfect, and he knows exactly what I need, and he tells me to do something, should I obey him? If I really feel loved by him and love him, I will. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. The Holy Spirit even draws us to love. Romans 5, 5. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And if we look at the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22. 
but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Love should be the primary motivation of our entire life. And love defeats fear. 1 John 4.18 There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. What's it saying? It's saying that if I really believe that God loves me, is going to meet my needs, take total care of me, sort of like that little kid that a mom picks up in her arms and just holds, does that kid have fear? Well, I shouldn't have fear either if I know that God is totally on my side. It should wipe away all fear in my life. Love is the end result of spiritual and psychological development. If we look at 2 Peter, it gives the entire list of the eight steps of spiritual growth, and the last step is charity or agape love. Now, what are the consequences of this system? First, the type of unconditional love that God provides meets our deepest needs and provides the safe attachment that we desperately need. I want to take that description, and I want you to think about that and give you a paraphrase of the description of God's love and ask yourself the question, what if you were in a relationship like this, would your needs be met? Here's my paraphrase. Love puts up with a lot, is calmly nice, is not competitive, is more concerned about others, humbly serves others, is not offensive in any way, is not demanding, is not irritating or easily exasperated, does not hold the past against you, loves the truth and hates evil, is always on your side trying to make you look good, always believes in you, always expects the best in every situation, never quits or abandons you no matter what happens, is always and will always be totally committed to you. Would your needs be met if you were in a relationship with somebody like that? Because God's love is not based on what we do, we can always be assured that His love will never fail. Would divorce ever exist if two people unconditionally loved each other like that? Unconditional love provides the basis for secure attachments. Because, see, if you love me that way, you're completely secure, I can totally trust you, and then if I can trust God to love me and make up for my own deficits, then I'm good enough too, and we're both okay, and that's the basis of a secure attachment. Unconditional love eliminates irrational jealousy, because if my needs are going to get taken care of, no matter what, and God loves me that way, then even if you leave me, I'm still going to be okay. It eliminates relationship deadlock. It was God that reached out first. I don't have to wait, and it's not me in a deadlock situation. I can trust Him to meet my needs. Sowing unconditional love will end up in reaping unconditional love. It fulfills the paradox of love. Since it doesn't attempt to get love, it gives love and therefore I will receive it back if I give it. Unconditional love easily adapts to change because it's not dependent on any needs or actions of the other person. Unconditional love is not easily provoked and stands strong in the face of the most vicious attacks and rejection. At the most, the unconditional lover will set boundaries for the good of the relationship. And that's what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation, that's the actions of the wives. 
Well, they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife and under the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of God, that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one with another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing, knowing you are there unto called, that you may inherit a blessing. It's saying in unconditional love, you're going to do what's right for the other person, no matter whether they're saved or they're not saved, no matter what the situation may be. Unconditional love is also the answer for codependency, addictions, domestic violence, dysfunction. Because I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to set boundaries, and what other people do, I'm going to trust in God to meet my needs. In order to have unconditional love, we must be delivered from our selfishness through faith. Do you see how this all ties back into that whole salvation and sanctification that we talked about earlier? Now, what does the process look like to have that kind of unconditional love? What are the steps that are critical to see that happen? First, I meant to change to God's type of love begins with the process of salvation by faith. I'm going to have to get a hold of God. I'm going to have to believe that he's going to meet my needs to set me free to really love somebody else. We must experience God's love as our ultimate attachment figure. As I already said, he is the ultimate person that can be trusted as always available and is emotionally sensitive no matter what. Hebrews 4.15 For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. How does he see us? One of his dear children, who he loves without regard to our works or even our failures. In other words, I've got to see myself through God's eyes. I'm okay. And then I have to see other people through God's eyes. They're also okay. They're also his children through faith, and he loves them even with all their mistakes and failures. And what is that? They're okay, and I'm okay. Not because of ourselves, but because of what God does in and through us, and that provides a secure attachment style. In the Bible, we have a model of that, and that's the model of Jonathan and how much he was able to touch David and touch all the people around him. Secure attachment styles are changed through the experiences of healthy, earthly, and heavenly attachments. It's the people around me, it's God, and it's the people around me that are going to affect me as I trust in faith, believing that God is going to meet my needs. Finally, we achieve secure attachment style when we are able to deeply attach and yet maintain good boundaries. The more secure we are that our needs will be met and the more love we feel, the more motivated we will be to meet the needs of others and show them love. And as we sow that, it's going to come back to us, isn't it? Even before we fully develop a secure attachment style, we can start reaching out in unconditional love and start developing that. And that whole cycle of sowing and reaping will come upon us and change us. Faith is the key that holds the entire process of development of love together. Ideally, we begin by believing there were value to others and that others are trustworthy and that we're capable of obtaining love from each other. So what am I saying? We need the secure attachment style. We need the experience of God's love. And we need to believe that God can be trusted to meet all of our needs, to be set free to love in this way. We must realize that God is love. And we must attach fully and unconditionally unto him through faith. 
I want you to think about something for a second now. I want to read those same words about love because God is love. And I want you to ask yourself the question, can I safely attach to God? God puts up with a lot and is calmly nice, is not competitive, is more concerned about others, humbly serves others, is not offensive in any way, is not demanding, is not irritating or easily exasperated, does not hold the past against you, loves the truth and hates evil, is always on your side trying to make you look good, always believes in you, always expects the best in every situation, never quits or abandons you no matter what happens, and is always and will always be totally committed to you. Do you realize that's what God is like? And if he's like that, can we trust him to meet our needs? If he's like that, can we have a close, intimate relationship with him? I want to close with a very specific story to help pull this all together. This is a story by the man by the name of Harry C. Mabry. And he basically talks about sort of a vision that he had. And in this vision, it was time for him to go to heaven. And he went to God and said, God, I really want to appreciate heaven. And therefore, would you do me a big favor? Would you let me first go down to hell and see what hell is like so I can realize all the benefits of heaven? And when he got to hell, he was really shocked because hell wasn't anything like he expected hell to be. In hell was this great banqueting table and everybody was seated around it. And on this table was the best food you can imagine, you know, steak and lobster and uh, mashed potatoes and turkey and everything else that you could possibly imagine was on this table. But there was a rule in hell. And the rule was you could only eat with four-foot chopsticks. And therefore, they would take some food in their four-foot chopsticks and turn it around and try to put it in their mouth, and they couldn't. So they were all starving to death. And that's why it was called hell. So then he went on to heaven. But when he got to heaven, he was really shocked. And heaven was exactly that same table. Item for item. And in heaven was exactly the same rule. You had to eat with four-foot chopsticks, but they were having a great time feeding each other. See, what's the difference between heaven and hell? It's the same difference between selfish and unconditional love. In hell, one says, hey, give me that food other. No, you give me the food first. No, they're looking out for themselves. But in heaven, because they know that God is going to meet all their needs and take care of them, they say, hey, what would you like? Here, have this, have this, have this, have this. They give, and the other people give back to them. They have a great and fantastic time loving each other. And see, that's what this is all about. God is love. And he wants us to learn to love the way he loves. And he wants us to reach out to other people. It's our relationship as we believe in him that sets us free from our selfishness and transforms us to the image of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you didn't leave us in the selfish love of this world. But Lord, you set us free. You loved us first. Lord God, you sent your son to die for us. And then you work through your process of salvation as our faith grows more and more. We're set more and more free to love each other. And when we do that, our needs are also met. And Lord, we ask that you make us into those kind of unconditional agape lovers that you want, that we might be one with you and one with each other. In Jesus' name, amen.